Today's project was sent to me by Judah. I've never seen it before, so let's go ahead and run it. For some reason it couldn't find the main scene, so I had to select it manually. Wow, this is a big project. Let's go with main menu. Top down shooter template. Okay, that makes me wonder how much of this is original, but let's just crack on. Start. Right off the bat, this is very slick. Oh, you can dash to avoid as well. Honestly, this controls very well and it's fun. It's fun to play. There are a lot of really nice touches here. You've got the vignette when you get hit. You've got like a little bit of screen shake and I think it slows down as well. So there's a lot of feedback. And I guess that's the end. <laughs> or it's crashed. Oh, I think it's crashed because maybe that's the last level. The first thing I noticed was that all the scenes were just in a big flat list. And the same goes for the scripts. Now, there is no right or wrong way to organize a Godot project. And that's really the beauty of this engine is you can just do whatever makes sense for you. But personally, I find it much more manageable to group things based on function. So here I'm just creating lots of different subfolders to keep the project a bit more organized. So hopefully you can see the value in that. I think it makes the project a lot more manageable. And now that that's out of the way, I can start to wrap my head around what we're dealing with here. I soon realized that moving all those files around had broken some references, but thankfully this was easily fixed by right-clicking on each scene, clicking Edit Dependencies, and then pressing the magical Fix Broken button. I'm not sure why Godot didn't update the references automatically in this case, but at least it was a fairly quick fix. After fixing all the dependencies, I ran into another error, and this was because of a hard-coded scene path in one of the scripts. Now, to avoid having scene paths scattered throughout your code base, what I normally like to do is create an autoload script, which contains all my scene paths as constants so that they're centralized in one place. In this case, the error was coming from a function which is used to transition between, say, the main menu and the game. And since the function assumed that all these scenes were in a folder together, I had to do a little bit more reshuffling. There we go, everything's working again. Fine. I am seeing some errors being spammed though, so the main concern is this. Can't change this state while flushing queries. What on earth does that mean? So someone's asked this same question. Basically what's happening is we're trying to add children to the scene in response to a collision event. This is being called in response to a collision event and that's not allowed. To fix this, we have to use call deferred, which basically calls a function in the next frame. In general, this should be used sparingly because it kind of confuses the flow, but in situations like this, it is incredibly useful. Since our deferred function might have to spawn multiple items, we're gonna add all of the pending items to an array. So we'll define a variable, pending items, which is an array of nodes. We don't want to call deferred inside the loop. We wanna call that at the very end of this function. If an item was added, if not is empty, then we'll call this function. And this function is going to loop over all of our pending items, add them to the scene, and then clear that array. And now that we kind of understand what this is doing, I'll give it a more sensible name. So instead of deferred loop, we'll call this spawn items. Just like in my last video, because this is private, I'm prefixing it with an underscore. And as someone pointed out, the style guide actually suggests putting two line breaks in between functions. So that's what I'll do. So last time we had seven errors being logged. Uh, let's play again. Fantastic, so no errors that time, just those warnings that we were seeing before. This one is annoying me a bit. This next warning was something about a UID being invalid. And fortunately, it was fixed by just resaving the resource. I promise this doesn't normally happen. Godot is normally very well behaved, but clearly this project is in a strange state somehow. So the only warning we got left is this one. For our final warning, Godot was complaining because we were emitting a signal from outside the class where the signal was defined, which admittedly is a bit strange. So the fix for this is simple. 
we just instead call a function on that class and emit the signal from inside of that function. In general, it's a good idea to fix any warnings as they arise, even if they don't seem important, because otherwise you might not notice warnings that genuinely do matter. I'm going to start with the world script, because that sounds important. It looks like this registers itself with globals. I suppose that's so that the world can be easily accessed from anywhere. And then we call deferred update level. The reason we use call deferred is that sometimes your code relies on things that aren't ready, funnily enough, in the ready function. And the update level function gets a level from our levels array, which is an export variable. This export annotation allows us to edit the value of this variable from the editor in the places where this script is used. The world script is used in the world scene, and we can see here that the levels array has been populated with two levels. So when the world begins, we call update level. That's just going to load whatever level we're currently on and call start. So presumably the levels have a start method. I guess that's in level parent, yep. I decided to rename level parent to just level, which makes a lot more sense because level one is a level. It's not a level parent. In fact, the class name is just level already. So I don't know why the file was called level parent. So the world calls the start function of the level, does some other setup with the level, stores a reference to it and adds it to the scene. And that is how the game begins. I've seen this a few times where we are connecting to a signal and we're defining the function inline. There's nothing wrong with that technically, but I do find it a bit unsightly. So what I would personally do is extract it to a named function on scene changed. I just find that a lot more readable. It means the contents of the function aren't cluttering up the call site here and the function has a name, which just makes it that much more obvious what this code is for, what the purpose of this is, if you're just kind of scanning through the file. I've just opened one of the levels and wow, I can't see a thing because of all these collision shapes. I mean, this is crazy. Every enemy has multiple collision shapes and they really obscure things. Fortunately, we can solve this by toggling the visibility of those collision shapes, which doesn't affect their functionality. That is now a lot nicer to look at. There is still some visible markup here, and that looks like a ray cast, which is attached to the enemies. This is used to determine if the enemies can shoot the player. Basically, if there's a clear path, then they can shoot. However, given that they're not shooting every frame, it's quite wasteful to use a raycast object for this because looking at the documentation, a raycast is calculating intersection every physics frame. So even though we're only using that result sporadically when we're actually trying to shoot, it's still performing that intersection calculation. So if we have a lot of enemies in the scene, that is obviously quite computationally expensive. I think it would be much cleaner if we just performed the raycast on demand, basically when we want to shoot the player. So they're trying to shoot me every frame, but this method will only actually shoot if the cooldown has elapsed. So what I would do instead of all this is if gun dot can shoot, if can see player, then we shoot. I'm going to delete the shoot ray altogether going to get rid of this update shoot ray function. I'm going to get rid of can shoot and we're going to make can see player instead. The shoot ray was checking collision channel two, which is walls. So we're going to have to write a raycast function to do that same thing. So we want to go from the enemy position to the player. The player is stored in our globals class by the look of it. And for the collision mask, this is where we specify the layers that we want to collide with, which in our case is layer two. That's why it's the second one from the right. I'm kind of basing this on Godot's documentation here, but I'm guessing we don't really need all of these zeros. By default, Godot only shows the first 16 collision channels, which is probably more than enough for most games. 
So we'll just specify 16 collision channels here. And this one being set to one means that's the one we're gonna collide with. Finally, we're gonna return result dot is empty, meaning that if the Raycast didn't collide with anything, then we can in fact see the player. Now this is complaining because this should be the position of the player, not the player node. So that's that function done. I don't know why we're adding friction only when we're trying to shoot, but I'm just gonna leave it like that for now. These can be combined with an and. I think I have changed the logic very slightly here because now we're only gonna enter this block when the gun is actually able to shoot, whereas previously it was only actually checking the sight. So that is a slight change of behavior. I think this probably shouldn't be here. This has nothing to do with shooting. And even this, you know, is related to movement. So it's confusing that this is all in the handle shooting function. But I'm gonna leave it as is for now. The final thing I have to do is implement this can shoot method. So can shoot returns a bool. And that is gonna basically contain this condition, which we were previously checking in shoot. Which means that all of this can be unindented. I've probably broken something, but let's just see how it plays. Holy moly. Clearly the player is also using that shoot logic and was relying on this condition being there. So we'll just fix that in the player. Wherever the player's calling shoot, we're gonna say try shoot. And try shoot is gonna be a wrapper around the shoot function, which first checks this condition. So this is kind of equivalent to what the shoot function was before. I quite like using this try prefix when you want a function that's gonna do something but only if some condition passes because it just makes it really obvious from the name that this may or may not shoot. So I'm pretty happy with that. If I had more time, I would probably try and tidy up the movement logic, separate that from the shooting, but I think this is already a lot cleaner than it was. That's more like it. Although it was fun to have a crazy machine gun. But most importantly, is this guy gonna shoot me? Yeah, I think that's working exactly as before, but the advantage is it's no longer doing a raycast every single frame, so it should be a lot more performant. That's all for today, but if there's anything else you wanna see or if you have some code that you'd like me to take a look at, please get in touch and subscribe if you wanna see more content like this.